to tell you everything he is. But the best way that I could say it is this. God's been good. Amen. In my life, I feel blessed beyond my wildest dreams when I go to sleep each night. And though I've had my share of hard times, by my side he's always stood. God been good to you. Brother Tim, come on up and preach for us. Well, you could say that's my song. That is my song. One thing before I get started. This is my runny nose, Hanky. Let me see, I've got another one here. And this is my eye, Hanky. My wife says... Do not use the runny nose hanky. Use the eye hanky on your eye. But that song, this morning, I'm going to uh, give my testimony. Uh, it's not about me. It's about my Savior and Lord that brought me through those times, that time that I was in Vietnam. I had the privilege last week of speaking at Kalis Church, uh, Pastor Boucher's church, and I walked down, and this guy walks up and says, how you doing, jarhead? And so, but he could say that because he's a Marine. But this morning I've entitled... Uh, the message, Call to Duty. And I want us to look at three calls to duty this morning. The first will be my call to duty to my country and to the Marine Corps. It took me almost 20 years to talk about my time over there. My kids was grown. I hadn't told my mom and dad or my brother. Why, I don't know. Maybe just because I wanted to forget about it and put it out of my mind. But Pastor Kyle asked me if I would give my testimony and what happened to me over there. So I'm going to tell you what happened, not to bring any glory to me, none, but all the glory to God. Down in the front here, I've left some pictures of when I was over there. In this shadow box, I didn't bring it for the medals or anything like that. But there's three men in that picture, if you want to come by and look at those three men. Those were the last three men that I was with in Vietnam. The middle is Kevin Eugene Cahill. If you go to Washington, D.C., you'll find his name on the wall there. These were the last three men that I was with, and we were all wounded. But I'll just go through the Purple Hearts that I received. 
the first was, well, when I got there, I'll just, I'll just begin here, and I'll try to kind of hurry this up because I want to get to the message. That's the main thing. But when I got there, they, I was in Da Nang, and they took me out to, I don't know where I was at. I was just a peon. I was just a machine gunner. The, I just went where they told me to go. So they said, well, you're going to go out to Charlie Company, 1st Battalion, 1st Marine Division. So I got on this Amtrak. They took me out there, out in the middle of nowhere. I didn't see anybody. So they said, uh, just stay right here. I said, somebody from Charlie Company will be coming to pick you up. So it just being a, uh, start uh, the rainy season. I jumped off the Amtrak. And was in the mud up to my knees. I thought, well, that's, that's not good. They said, well, just spend the night in this French pagoda that had been bombed out. So I was very tired. I got to Da Nang, and then I, they sent me out there in the middle of nowhere. I didn't see anybody. I was in a war, right? And so they just said, just spend the night here at this pagoda. So I got uh, my inflated uh, raft out, blew it up, went to sleep. That night I, I dreamt that something was running across my neck. And I was so tired I, I didn't pay attention to it. Next morning I woke up, looked up into the rafters, and there was hundreds of rats <laughs> running across. So that was my welcome to Vietnam. But anyway, to get started, I want to get uh, this uh, said. But the first uh, Purple Heart, and at, at the time, we didn't even know, I didn't know I was getting a Purple Heart. In the Marine Corps, the only way you could get a Purple Heart was for the corpsman to write it out. I didn't know anything. I didn't know I was even getting a Purple Heart. But anyway, we were to, I was in Charlie Company 1-1. Charlie Company 1-1 and Delta Company was to meet up and we were to go to this rendezvous, and we were to do a sweep of an area where the, uh, uh, we suspected there was a high volume of uh, Viet Cong. And we were to meet up there, and we were to sweep this area, and we were to drive into Bravo Company and Alpha Company. Well, on the way out there, it took us several hours, so we had to spend the night. So we had to set up a perimeter. And I have a book here of a tank, and I, we was riding on the tanks and Amtraks as we, we went to meet up with, uh, uh, to make that sweep. So that night we set up uh, a perimeter. The tank that I was riding on pulled up uh, on a dike. And so the next morning we got out. And one thing, you never want to ride on the front of a tank because... The tank was set like this. Next morning, I got on the tank. The tank dropped down over the, <laughs> the dike, and it hit a mine. And I was sitting on the tank, and they said that I was blown about 10 foot in the air. And when I come to, the corpsman had his finger down my throat, pulling the mud and dirt and stuff out. I was trying to get the stuff out of my nose. And I had a headache for about two months, but that was the first uh, purple Heart I got, and I didn't know I was even getting it. The second time that I was wounded, I did not get a Purple Heart for. It was the time that I probably bled the most, but we were in this area. We were doing another sweep, and it was suspected, it was suspected uh, stronghold of the Viet Cong, and it was the only city or the only village that I had seen in Vietnam that was gated or had a fence around it. It was a huge, huge place. And the fence was probably 10 foot high. And they said, and this was our orders, that we were to kill everything inside the fence. That was our objective because it was hostile. They, we were told it was hostile. So as we came up to this village, or this, it was huge. I mean. I, I could look either way, and I couldn't see the end of it. It was just, it was the only place I seen it there it was fenced in. So some of the tanks would go in, but there was a lot of area in between the tanks. So 
what a lot of us had to do, we had to kick the fence down. We had to kick that fence and get through that fence. So as I did that, I kicked the fence through and I stepped down. How many of you have heard of punji pits? Well, as I stepped through that fence, I fell into a punji pit. The punji pit was probably, I don't know, six foot deep, maybe five, six foot wide, and maybe three or four foot deep. But these punji pits, what they would do, they would put them in the sides of the, the pit, and they would sharpen them. And they would stick up, and when you'd fall in, you would fall in, and they would run into your body. Well, when I stepped through that, I fell into that pit, but the, the worst thing, there was that it was booby-trapped also. There was two strings of wire with hand grenades on the wires. And as I stepped through that, I fell into the punchy pit. I had several of the stakes ran in me. The worst was in my thigh, and I, I think it ran clean up in me. I, I was bleeding. But as I fell in that, by God's mercy, those great grenades did not go off. They had been there for so long, apparently they had rusted. And it seemed like it was hours before they got me out of there because it's afraid to move me, afraid that the grenades would go off. But I didn't get a purple heart for that because the corpsman was killed in that operation. But it was probably the time that I maybe bled the most. But the second purple heart that I got, and I'll try to hurry up here, but the second Purple Heart I got, we were stationed north of Da Nang, and that's where most of my time was spent, north of Da Nang. But at this time, there was a big operation, and I've studied it a little bit. After I got out, I have some books, and I've studied it, and I know basically what operation I was on. But we were to rendezvous at the north at Quang Tri or Dong Ha, and there was a big staging area, and there was, you know, uh, I think there was uh, 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 First Battalion, First Marine Division, First Battalion, Third Marine Division, but there was all kinds of choppers, and we were to go in waves to this stronghold right at, at the DMZ, and we were to go into there uh, and to uh, uh, try to... Uh, extract the uh, Viet Cong. But one thing you, you never want to be, you never want to be on that last wave. I was on the sixth wave going in. And that sixth wave, we were sitting ducks. And I can remember when we was going in, and the chopper was banking, I could remember seeing those 50 rounds come up. I could see the tracer rounds from them. And as we leveled off, I could start hearing the metal flying. I could, I remember the metal coming up through the bottom of the chopper. And I just closed my eyes, and we made a hard landing. The, one of the motors was on fire in the chopper. And so when I tried to get off, I couldn't. I didn't even know I was hit. I never even knew I was wounded. I was probably so scared that I didn't realize I was hurt. But as I tried to get off that chopper, I couldn't. I couldn't walk. I had so much metal in my legs that I, my legs wouldn't work. I think there was you know, four or five men dead on the chopper at that time. And there's only two of us alive, and one was the, uh, the machine gunner. And he was yelling and screaming, and I crawled over to him. His left arm had been severed. Uh, it was off 
only the skin was holding it, and I put it back across him. That was my second Purple Heart. And the last Purple Heart that I got was with these three men here. And as I go back and think about what went on, it was the, how many of you heard of the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Any of you heard of that? That's what we were on. And they landed us on top of this hilltop it had been defoliaged or Agent Orange or whatever you want to call it. And we landed there and it seemed like it took hours and hours just to cut our way through the jungle. And this man here in the middle was the point man. And it seemed like we had gone hours. I'm taking about 15 minutes for this, too long. but. But anyway, all of a sudden, everything just let loose. Everything, grenades were coming in on us. They were firing from the trees on us. It, it was just a mess. I mean, it was, it, it was chaos. And of course, I was a squad leader at that time. I had three men under me. We were the gun squad. And as I, they yelled, guns up, guns up. And always, <laughs> you never wanted to hear that, guns up. And as I started to go forward to get my men to go forward, because we, our job, my job, was to lay down a fire and try to gain superiority. That, that was our job. That was my job as a squad leader. And as I started there to go to the front, all of my men had been wounded. They'd all been shot or a grenade or something, I don't know what, but they, all, they were just laying there. So I took the machine gun and I ran up and as I got up onto the Ho Chi Minh Trail, it was, it was really wide, it was just like a road. And as I got up there and I could see, on the rising, I could see the machine gunner up there and I could hear the bullets just whizzing around me and hitting the dirt in front of me. Just zing, 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 zing. And as I laid the gun down and started firing back, Kevin was already dead. He was already laying beside me. And I could hear the bullets, you know, just hitting him. Just thud, 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 thud. And the black man here, Edwards, he ran up beside me to help put the, the rounds in the machine gun. And that's the last I remember. I woke up, I thought I was back in the States. I woke up on a, a, a medical ship, the Okinawa. But that was my third Purple Heart. And I'm not here this morning. All I'm here this morning to do is to glorify God for his mercies over there. And he brought me through that for a reason. I wasn't even saved at the time. I didn't even know Christ at the time. But God knew. God, the Alpha and the Omega, see, he knew my beginning from my end. He knew. I didn't know it. I didn't know that I was going to be saved. <laughs> God knew me. He knew me in the womb. And he knew one day that I would serve him. Linda and I have been married for 50 years. the best of our ability, we have tried to serve the Lord. Now, which one was my tear one? This one. But that's what we've tried to do. Have we always done it? Have I always done it? No. 
sad to say that there was times in my life that I backslid. But how could I not? Being a Christian, not want to serve the Lord. How could I not do that? That was my call to duty to my country and to the Marine Corps. But now I want us to look I want us to look at someone we not, might not think of as being called to duty. Do you realize that Jesus Christ was called to duty here on earth? He came to die for me he came to die for all of you. That was his call to duty. That's the second call to duty that I want us to look at this morning. Turn back to in your Bibles, if you would, to First Thessalonians, <clears throat> chapter five, to get us started this morning. First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24. It says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that you came to die, that we might have a heavenly home. Father, I just pray this morning as we read your word that you'll draw us closer to you, realizing what you did for us. Your call of duty to the God the Father. Father, now we just pray that you bless our time together, bless your word, and we just pray that we'd, all the, the glory would be to you. It's in Christ's name we ask it. Amen. If you would, just briefly turn back there to the book of John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Chapter 6. John chapter 6. Here in John uh, chapter 6, we find that Jesus had worked the miracles. He'd worked the miracles there and uh, of the, uh, the five loaves there and the two, uh, the two fishes and he'd worked these miracles and he had this great following uh, 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 at that time. But anyway, this great following uh, followed him there. I'm just going to shorten this up. I'm not going to read all of it, but they were following him and they had... Uh, he had fed this multitude, and after he fed these 5,000 men, there's probably that many women and children, but it was a multitude that was there, and he fed them with this, just this little bunch, and it says after that, there was a, an abundance left over, and that was a miracle, you see, and the people saw that miracle, but they didn't, it wasn't because of that miracle, it was because they were fed. They, they were hungry and they were fed. But anyway, it goes on. The uh, Bible goes on to say this, and I want to read this. It says there in, uh, let's uh, begin with verse, uh, let's begin with verse 31 there. It says, Our fathers did eat man in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth his life unto the world. You see, that was Jesus' call to duty right here in this verse. Then, then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, 
I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me, and believe not. For all, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and in him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the will, is the Father's will which hath sent me, that all which he hath given me I should lose nothing and should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. That's a pretty comfortable comforting thought, isn't it? To know the one that came from God to die for the sins of the world. Turn back to Matthew. We're going to look at some verses here. Matthew chapter 20. Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28. Even as the Son of Man come not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now I want us to turn back to John, the 17th chapter here. We'll look at this very briefly here. But I taught on this, I think it was one Wednesday night, about the, uh, the high priestly uh, prayer there of Jesus, and uh, this is not this is truly Jesus's uh, prayer here. It was just right before he was to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, and this is his prayers. You see, for himself, for his apostles, and also for us. But what I want us to see the, this is that his call was from God, and everything he did on earth. The Father told him to do. And we can see it here in this prayer. But let's look at this prayer there in John uh, chapter 17, verse 1. And I'll, I'll go all the way through it. But it, these words spake Jesus, verse 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son that thy son may all, also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory that I had with thee before the world was. Can you imagine this? Here, can you imagine the glory... He was in the very bosom of God. He was in heaven. And he, he, he just wanted to get back to that glorification that he had in heaven. He had to come and to die and to take up on the flesh like you and me in order that he might shed his blood upon the cross of Calvary. But let's go on down. There's some other keys that I want to see here. In verse 8, let's just look at verse 8 there very quickly. He's speaking, he prayed for himself. He prayed that he would be glorified, that the Father would be glorified. And then in verse 8, he's praying for his, the apostles here. He says, for I have given unto them, the apostles, the uh, disciples there, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them. And have known surely that I came out from the Father, and they have believed that thou didst send me. Remember John 1 1? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and and the Word was God. And on down through the verses until verse 14, it says, and uh, uh, he he manifested himself. And uh, this is what, what he's talking about here. But anyway, let's go on. I pray for him, verse 9. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, 
for they are thine. Uh, and all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. But what I want us to see here is when I was reading this and when I was thinking about this message, I was thinking about how Jesus wanted to glorify God the Father. And that's been my, that's been my only thought for 50 years after Linda and I accepted Christ was to bring honor and glory to God. What did Jesus do? He brought glory to God the Father. He came and died for me. If you're here this morning and if you're saved, it is your call to duty. It is my call to duty to love the Lord, to serve the Lord, to tell other people about Christ. That's our call to duty here this morning as Christians. This is what we're to do. But that's why Jesus came. I've tried to keep it as short as I can. But we know why Jesus came. He came to die for each one of you here this morning. And as I look around, I know a lot of you. And I know a lot of you accepted Christ. But now, you see, that was my call to duty. After I was saved, that was my call to duty to tell others about Christ. I want us to look at some things this morning. And it won't be much longer. And I've told you this before. All of you know how I was saved. But I was sitting back there, and this pastor, I was saved under a very godly man. A man that taught me a lot. Basically everything I know about the Bible, other than my studying of the word myself. His name was Pastor Ballard. A lot of you folks know him. What a teacher. What an influence he had on my life. And as I can look at our family, I can look at others that were saved, that were saved just through my family. All my kids are saved. And their spouses are saved. That young man back there, my son-in-law, could probably preach right now. God's good, isn't he? But anyway, yeah, this is the eye, okay. Almost got them mixed up there. Almost put that snotty one right on my eye. I'm doing good, honey. But anyway, but anyway, I was sitting back there one day, one Sunday morning, and Pastor Ballard got up there And he preached on hell. Wasn't saved. He preached on hell. Linda got out of her seat and came forward. And I said, I'm not saved. I'm going to hell. And I'm going to show you why. That God doesn't want any of you to go to hell this morning. I'm going to show you what he did for you this morning and what he's done for me and what he's done for you. (sighs) But you see, the Holy Spirit convicted me that morning. He worked mindly in my heart. I mean, he tugged so hard on me, he almost drugged me off that seat and come forward. But, But anyway... I just want you to know this morning that there's a heaven to gain and there's a hell to shun. 
And I pray this morning that you heed the word of God if you're here this morning and do not know him as your Savior. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is it. <laughs> uh, but turn back to Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12 says this, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the powers, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual witness, wickedness in high places. You see, the ruler right now is Satan. Look around us. Look around the world. Look around the United States. Can you not see the wickedness that's going on? Can you not see the devil's hand in everything? I think you can, can't you? Amen? We can all see it, can't we? And his influence is powerful. And his influence is mighty. Michael didn't even bring accusation against him. That's how powerful he is. That's how wicked he is. And he wants to draw everyone to hell with him. Hell was not made for us. Hell was made for Satan and his fallen angels. I've heard people, for 50 years I've heard people say this to me. Tim, you don't really believe that a loving God would send someone to hell. And I agreed with him. God doesn't send anyone to hell. You had that choice here this morning. I had that choice here this morning. I preached on that. On soul liberty. Or the right of conscience. Or the free will of man, you see. God knew that one day I would be saved. And by his hand of mercy, he brought me through Vietnam just to show me how powerful and wonderful he is. How could I not serve him? But there is a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. But someone asked me, I said, well, Tim, why? why? Why do I have to ask Jesus to die for me? Do you, do you believe that I've had that question asked me? I have. Why? Why do you have to ask Jesus? Why do you have to put your trust and faith in him? Why do you have to, to repent and, and realize that you're a sinner? I'm glad you asked me that. Let's go back. To Genesis chapter 2. I'll tell you why. Genesis chapter 2. And verse 16. This is why. We have to have a savior. This is why Jesus came. This was his call to duty to come to die for the sin of the world. You notice I didn't say sins. I said for the sin, the sin of one man. One man. We have to go back some 6,000 years, more than 6,000 years to the garden there to understand why all of us need a Savior. So there in Genesis chapter 2, And verse 16, it says this. You all know it. You've heard this a hundred times. And the Lord God commanded the man, Adam, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. 
They did not die physically that day, did they? They died spiritually. And from that time on, way back there in the garden, everyone that has been born has been born with a sinful nature. That is why we have to have a Savior. Turn on over there in uh, Genesis chapter 3. It's the first mention of Jesus coming. It's the first mention of the, it's the first uh, uh, prophecy of the coming of the Messiah. There in uh, Genesis chapter 3. And verse 15. And I'm not going to go into detail on this because I've got just a little bit more to cover. But it says, And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And this is talking about the death, burial, the death of Jesus Christ. That this is the first prophecy of Jesus having to come. This was prophesied of his call to duty way back then. He knew that one day he would have to come and die for that sin that Adam committed there in the garden. And he knew that he had to come to earth, you see. Jesus knew that he would have to come and he would have to take on a physical body just like us and flesh and blood. He knew he had to come and he knew it way back then that he would have to come and to die for Tim Kemp. He knew that. Let's see, I want, I want to get Matthew in here. Well, let's turn back to Luke. Let's, let's, let's turn it back. Turn back to the book of Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Luke, the 16th chapter. Luke, the 16th chapter, beginning with verse 19. And you're all familiar, you're all familiar with this passage of Scripture. But here is Jesus speaking. How many of you have a red letter Bible? Or, but Jesus is speaking here. And Jesus is retelling this story about what occurred between Lazarus and the rich man. And I just want to read this to you. And I want to read to you the severity of hell. I want to read to you how bad hell is. And it's why I came forward because I knew I did not want to spend eternity in hell. But here in, verse, in Luke 16th chapter and verse 19, and I'll read this. And it says, There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and, lay, and Lazarus in his bosom. Now let me just set the scene here for you. In the Old Testament, hell and Sheol are the same. Okay, In the New Testament, it's Hades. But in the Old Testament, it was Sheol. And in my understanding is that at that time, in the center of the earth, there was a Sheol. And at that time, Satan had the keys to hell. He had the keys to Sheol. But... At that time, there, there was two places. 
There was hell, and there was Abraham's bosom. And the Bible says that there was a gulf fixed between. And the one that was in hell could not get to these that was in Abraham's bosom that was not feeling all the heat, if you will. But there was a gulf fixed between. So let's go on. Let's read a little bit more about this. And it says there in, in verse 24. Well, let's read 23 again. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. It's a terrible place. The Bible says there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth and there will be crying and pleading and screaming because every demonic person that you can think of is going to be in hell. He's going to be there and Satan's going to be there. and They're in hell. Hitler and all these men and all the rapists and all the whoremongers and everybody will be there in hell and they'll be crying out. Please, please get me out of this place. I'm in torment. I can't stand this heat. It's terrible. Please, just send someone and just dip their finger in some water and lay it on my tongue. Do you want to go there this morning? Is there anyone here that hasn't trusted Christ? Ask yourself, do you want to go there? I think not. God is a loving God. He will not send anyone there. He doesn't want any of you to go there. It's your choice. It's your choice this morning. Romans 3.10 says this. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. That's what the Bible says. There's none righteous, no, not one. Why? Because of Adam's sin back in the garden. We're all born with that sinful nature. Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every one of us here this morning have come short. I've come short. But thank God I have a loving God. And all he, all he asked me to do as a Christian is just to come and confess that sin. I'll have to confess the sin this week. I know I will. I never will. Because the Amish are so slow on those buggies. And I cannot stand getting behind one of those Amish in a buggy. And I'm going to have to say, God, forgive me. Linda says, have a little patience. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That's the separation from God, you see. That's the separation for the love that God has for us. That's the separation where we'll not have to suffer anymore. That's, that's where Don will not have that back problem anymore. Where Roy and Sheila will not have that back problem anymore. Where I'll not have these kidney stones anymore. going to be a pretty wonderful time for me. In Romans 3.23, it does say that. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? That's what it's all about. If you're here this morning and you do not know Christ as your Savior,
let this be the morning that you make that decision. Turn back to book, the book of Revelation. And I'll finish with this. And you know where I'm going with this. Brother Fred is teaching on the book of Revelation. But I want us to go back through to the book of Revelation chapter 20. Oh, by the way, remember I was telling about Abraham's bosom and hell there? Well, you know what happened? You know what, what one of the wonderful things that happened when Jesus died? Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, he descended and took the keys away from Satan. And those people that were, Satan thought he had them. He said, they're down here. Even though they're separated by this gulf, they're never going to heaven. They're never going to heaven. I've got them down here. And one of the great things that Jesus did before he ascended upon high, he first descended down to hell and led those captives up out of there. And Jesus now holds that key. He is the key. Jesus is the key to heaven. Let's read this. Here in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11, and this will, this will be the last. I know it's a little long. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was not found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And thank God my name's written in the book of life. Amen. Amen. Thank God, because that's what's going to happen. That's what, he, that's what God's going to refer to there in the future that Brother Fred's talking about. That's where... Let's go on. I want to read. Uh, I'll finish up here. And, uh, the book of life in verse 12. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books... Not the book of life, but out of the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And that's why, and I might be wrong on this, I, I could be very wrong on this. If I am, please forgive me, I still love you, love me. But these books, you see, that they were judged at, I believe that there's going to be Degrees of punishment, just as there's going to be degrees of rewards for us as Christians in heaven. And that's what these books were here for. It's still going to be hell. It's still going to be terrible. It's still going to be awful. It's still going to be for eternity. But that's what these books were open. And let's look in verse 13 and verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, Faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. You see, if you just call upon him, if you just accept him as your savior, he'll take you through this life. It might not always be easy. It hasn't always been easy for Linda and I. It hasn't as a Christian. It has not always been easy. We've went through some tough times. But he is faithful, isn't he? If you're here this morning, if you don't know Christ as your savior, I just, I beg you this morning, Come this morning when the invitation is given. The blessings upon blessings that God has bestowed upon Linda and I. That's just here on earth. 
But if you here this morning, don't put it off. If God hasn't promised it's tomorrow. You don't know what is it is. Pastor. Come forward.